Good morning, everyone. We're just about ready to start. Um, I know some people had trouble getting logged in this morning, but don't forget we're recording. And just let me make a couple of quick announcements before I turn the meeting over to our president, Jane Sproul. Um, as you know, we have a co-sponsor this morning, eCare, Every Child a Reader in Escambia, and our presenters for our monthly lecture, update on our public schools, are Dr. Karen Barber from Santa Rosa County and Dr. Tim Smith from Escambia County Schools. Remember that your microphones and video cameras have been muted if you're part of the audience. This helps us conserve bandwidth. And we definitely want folks to ask questions. If you're in Zoom, please type your question in the Q&A area and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. If you're in Facebook, please post as you normally would. Remember, since we have two presenters, if you have a preference over who should answer your question or you want both of the superintendents to answer, please indicate who the question is for. As always, you can access our video recordings on demand by going to our website and using the Facebook and YouTube buttons. Okay, Jane, I'll turn the meeting over to you now. Okay. And we do have we do have people in, so people right. can get logged in. Right. Thank you, Mary Louise. You are you're tremendous. We could couldn't make it without you. I don't think I'm on. <laughs> yeah, you're on. I'm not, okay. Good. Um, welcome to our, our monthly meeting of March of this year. My name is Jane Spruill and I am the president of the League of Women Voters for the Pensacola Bay Area. Um, we are a nonpartisan political organization, which means we do not support or oppose particular candidates or parties. As many of you know, we worked very hard last year in 2020 with the election uh, being a big part of what we did, we registered voters and we helped to educate eligible voters through our candidate forums, publications, and speaking to community groups. But the work doesn't stop after the election. We continue on and currently we are focused on what's happening in the state legislature, which uh, went into session earlier this month. And I have a feeling our speakers for today are very interested in what's happening in Tallahassee as well. We are involved by writing letters, making phone calls, and soon we will be distributing a brochure, 12,000 copies of a brochure that we print every two years that lists the elected officials at the local level, the state level, and uh, the national level that gives complete uh, contact information for those individuals. So if you are involved in an issue that um, an elected official might be the person you need to contact. You will have that information handy and uh, ready to use. I want to also invite you to a meeting that we are have hosting this week. Sometimes we have a topic come up and it's not part of our, our regular routine. And we call that a hot topic session. And on Wednesday, March 24th um, at 1 p.m. Central Time, we will be able to enjoy the, and, and get involved with a meeting about the restoration of rights. Um, it's very important to the league. We've, that's a project that we have been actively doing over the past year to encourage former felons, returning citizens to vote and to help them along that way. This meeting, our speaker will be Cecile Schoon, who is the first vice president of the League of Women Voters at, at uh, the state level. She has had, uh, she has a wealth of experience in her uh, career. She's worked with the ACLU and the Florida legal community to develop programs and establish incentives to help these returning citizens uh, meet the challenges that they have and, and eventually hope that, that we will be able to include them in our voters. All right, um, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to uh, who we have here this morning as part of our meeting. This year, we started a new program called Partnerships and we are integrating a national league policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion into our work. And we saw an opportunity if we could develop partnerships with other nonprofit organizations. And that's what we've been doing is teaming up with groups that share common goals 
and are willing to provide expertise and experience that will benefit both organizations. For example, in the, during the uh, general election time, the Amer African American Heritage Society and the Kappa Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority joined us in hosting and moderating some of our forums for the candidates that were running for office. So uh, if there is anyone in the community that would like to know more about our partnership program, please uh, feel free to contact us if you're interested. And today it's my honor to welcome Ruthie Christie, the Executive Director of eCare, which stands for Every Child, a Reader in Escambia. Uh, she will be here to share some information about us, uh, with us <laughs> about her program. Uh, eCare is... Um, serves many roles in the community and, and uh, Ruthie Christie's background is a good fit for that. She's relatively new to this position. She believes that empowering children to love the process of learning is important and holds a master's degree in organizational psychology from the University of West Florida. Ruthie's favorite children's book is The Little Blue Truck because it teaches readers what we are for that when we are kind and respectful, we are more likely to get help from others. And my grandsons have this book and they love this book. So I'll turn it over to you, Ruthie. If you uh, could take a few minutes and give us an overview of what your organization's doing and how we can get involved. Good morning. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Just wanna say thank you to the League of Women Voters, and for all the work that you do in the community. We are very grateful to be a partner and to get to share and collaborate in this way. And a special thanks to Mary Louise for bringing us together in this virtual space. Uh, it's been a fun one to try to navigate. Uh, but yes, happy first day of spring. Can you believe it? We made it. Nice. <laughs> We're coming around the corner. And um, I'm very excited to share about eCare. So we are Every Child a Reader in Escambia. eCare has been part of our community since 2007. And our mission is to maximize children's potential through increased school readiness. So the vision that we have is lofty, but very simple, that we want every child in our community to come to kindergarten ready to learn. Um, and so the way that we do that is that we work specifically with high need pre-kindergarten students and their families and their teachers just to help get them ready. We're pretty laser focused on the four-year-old space in our community. And we've got a three-prong approach um, to what we call Project Ready. And so we do that through our Reading Pals program, which I know some people on this call have participated and volunteered. That's one-on-one -on -one mentoring where we match an adult with a pre-K student, particularly in Title I class, room um, and they come read to them in person for an hour a week. Um, of course, this is in normal times when we're allowed to do these things, um, but it's truly that one-on-one -on -one intervention. It's a literacy mentorship. And then we also um, work with educators. We do provide educator support, mostly in the form of supporting families. So for those district teacher classrooms in particular, we try to support the parents, the caregivers by providing resources, building home libraries, things like that. And then family engagement is where eCare has really taken wing, really due out of necessity to the pandemic. Um, because we know that at home is where children learn first. And so we're very focused on building the capacity of parents, families, caregivers to feel empowered that they know how to do that and how to engage their children with meaningful, robust conversation and and dialogue and that 30 million words initiative that we hear about so much in our community. And the way we've been able to do that recently is by uh, providing access to an app called Ready Rosie, which is really a very cool platform. It's, uh, it's you know, an evidence-based tool that is typically utilized by school districts um, because it does work hand in hand with teaching strategies with the software so that it curates playlists for parents and caregivers to see these modeled moments of everyday activities, things you're doing with your kids anyway, it doesn't require any extra tools or kits or, you know, special paper plates and scissors and glue, all that fun stuff, which is great, but this is really geared toward the things you're already doing anyway and turning those into teachable moments for your children. We are again focused on the pre-K space. Um, so so that's been a huge push for us 
recently is getting this resource into the hands of families who have four-year-olds in their home so that they can best benefit from this truly evidence-based content. Um, and so that's, that's sort of how we do this work is those three prongs, the mentoring for individual children, family engagement focus, and then also educator support. Um, we know that it's important. I think on this call, I'm probably preaching to the choir about why early learning is so important. Um, we've seen a big shift in our community, especially in the last few years to focus on that zero to five space because we know that kids who come in ready to learn at the kindergarten level, see better outcomes at the third grade level, which is tied to graduation rates. And it, it makes sense, right? If you consider that behind the, all of that data, there are individual children and stories that we're telling with those numbers. Um, we think that it's better to invest on the front end and put in time and care and, and loving relationships and one-on-one -on -one attention when these kids are four so that they can build that love of learning. Um, I am previously, and before this role, I did work in a classroom um, with three to six year olds. I was in a Montessori school, it was a wonderful experience. And um, what I saw out of that in my experience there was that there is no replacement for learning at home. And what we see in our community is that families want to do that and they could use some help. Um, and, and what does that look like? And so that is what eCare is here for. Um, why it's important to us is because not only, you know, everyone on our team and on our board, do we, we love kids and we want kids to be successful, but we love our community and we want our community to be successful and those things go hand in hand together. So I'm very excited to get to share the mission. Uh, like you mentioned, Jane, I'm new. I have been a reading pal in the past as a volunteer, um, but coming and joining the eCare team just in January of this year. And uh, I cannot say enough great things about the work our organization has been doing. I am very honored and humbled to get to step into this role and help lead that work now. Um, and I would like to invite everyone to join us on this mission. We are on a mission to get kids ready for kindergarten. And uh, we would love to have your support and your help. Um, we are gearing up for what we hope to be business as usual in schools this fall, where we have a goal of matching every Title I pre-K student with a reading pal. So whether that's volunteering your time every week um, to read, to come in and read, or if you like to box up books and send those home, or if you would like to support our mission, um, you can check out more about us at escambiareads.org. That's our website. And I would be absolutely happy to answer any questions and talk about children's literature. As you mentioned, Little Blue Truck is my, my favorite children's book these days. And, uh, and that is, that's truly what it is. We want to teach the love of learning because that stays with a kid for, for the rest of their life and sets them up for success. Thank you so much, Ruthie. Doesn't that make you want to just go out and read a book <laughs> to a child with a child? Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming and sharing your information. We are very fortunate today to welcome the education leaders for our area, Dr. Karen Barber and Dr. Tim Smith are each uh, in the first year of service as public school superintendents. And um, the responses and things I've heard in the community about both of you has been so positive and very productive. And I, as a retired teacher, I am very excited about that. Um, we have asked each of them to speak, but before we get to that, I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Karen Barber from Santa Rosa School District has been an educator for 33 years. She serves, has served as a teacher, school principal, adjunct professor for the University of West Florida. And the last 12 years, she was the director of federal programs. Just to mention a few of these federal programs that are very important. Uh, one is DJJ support, Student Support Program. It provides a successful transition of justice involved youth back into the school district. Dr. Barber has also worked with One Family, One Year, One Home Program, a transitional housing program for families experiencing homelessness. And, and, and she's uh, spent much time focusing on early reading intervention programs that were implemented in all the elementary schools in the district. Here, get to my uh, topic, okay. Uh, Dr. Barber is recognized for many of these collaboration efforts in the community and providing leadership in, the, in a form of president of the Homeless Coalition, the Kiwanis, YMCA, ARC Santa Rosa, 
She is also past president and founder of Santa Rosa Bridges Out of Poverty, a 501c3 focused on building resources for children and families in the county. Her recognitions go on to include Florida's native, I'm sorry, Florida's Innovative Technology Principal of the Year, uh, University of West Florida Distinguished Alumni Award, two, two years she was received that, Department of Children and Family Community Partner of the Year, Santa Rosa Cham Chamber uh, of Commerce Community Leader of the Year, Escarosa Coalition on the Homeless Grassroots Leadership Award in 2013. And next, I want to introduce to you Dr. Tim Smith, a Scambia School District's first appointed superintendent. And uh, just a little byline, <laughs> the League of Women Voters was very, very active in uh, for many, many years getting that on the ballot. And in 2018, a Scambia County residents voted to switch from an elective superintendent to an appointed superintendent. And Dr. Smith is the first of those um, in that position. He recognizes he's coming in with a strong foundation in Escambia County and uh, that has allowed him to lead the district in areas of closing achievement gaps and pushing student proficiency to new heights. As stated by Dr. Smith, you said, we must work for every student and we must be united in both our focus and our determination. Unity is essential to reaching our goals. Dr. Smith spent 31 years with the Orange County Public School System in Orlando as a teacher, a dean, assistant principal, and then 19 years of those years, <laughs> he was middle and high school principal. Finally, his, his last position was as executive director responsible for supervising 10 high schools and serving about 30,000 students. He holds degrees from the University of Delaware, Florida State University, and Central Florida University. He and Kim, his wife of over 30 years, also a teacher, are parents to two adult children and they are both Florida State grads. Dr. Smith is grateful to lead our school district. He seeks for every student to have a safe, positive and supportive learning environment um, and to go on to learn successfully and then become helpful, productive citizens. Thank each of you for coming. And we'd like to hear from Dr. Barber first, uh, followed by Dr. Smith. Thank you. All right, good morning. I'm gonna set my timer for 20 minutes here. But if I start to go long, Jane, please uh, please uh, prompt me. I will, I will. So I'm sure both Tim and I could talk for uh, for hours and hours about what's so important to us. Let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Um, Jane, can you see that? I can. That's All right, good. very good. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today. I just want to start out by saying already you all have, have shown an interest and support for our school district and for education. And, and I'm so glad you call yourselves the Pensacola Bay area because I, I think that um, when we divide ourselves by county lines or even uh, cities or towns or we're, 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 um, we're shortchanging the, the community. And uh, so it's, I mentioned to you all earlier, uh, Dr. Smith and I meet regularly. Um, we also have uh, Marcus Chambers who meets with us. He's superintendent in Okaloosa County. And the more we can collaborate and communicate and just approach um, opportunities and challenges together, the, the better it is for all our students. Um, Dr. Smith and I will share students throughout the school year. They'll move from Pens from Escambia County to Santa Rosa, and Santa Rosa to Escambia County. They're all our children. And, and so to work together and to have um, a collaborative approach with the League of Women Voters is, is, really, um, is really critical. So I'll talk a little bit about how um, we, uh, we do that. I don't, my screen is not advancing for some reason. 
Ah, there we go. Um, so uh, this is our, our formal mission and vision for Santa Rosa County, educating students for success, success by providing a superior, relevant education. And of course, our vision for our students is that they will be productive, successful contributors to, to society. Um, this is our formal uh, mission and vision. Uh, when I took office, one of the things that I shared with um, at the oath of office, but also with our, uh, our administrators and our school district is a little bit of an obsession that I've had since I was about three. Um, I'm a Catholic girl and my grandmother babysat me while I, uh, while my mom and dad both worked. My dad worked in a steel mill and my mom um, was a nurse. And uh, so gra my grandmother Glowaki and I would sit in front of her black and white TV. And uh, being a Catholic girl, or both of us being Catholic girls, we were just fascinated with um, President Kennedy. And so I have these vivid memories of uh, watching um, President Kennedy, his speeches, the parades, uh, sadly, the assassination, and eventually the uh, funeral procession for President Kennedy. And so my, for my whole adult life, I've continued to be fascinated by some of the things that were accomplished during his presidency. And, um, if you were around then, you, you probably remember we were in a space race with the Russians. And uh, from that, NASA was formed. And there, um, there's this wonderful story about President Kennedy walking down the halls of NASA. And he sees a janitor mopping the floor. And he walked up to the janitor and said, well, good morning, sir. Uh, what is your job? And the custodian looked at the president right in the eye and said, Mr. President, my job is to put a man on the moon. And I love that story because I think the more we're clear about what our mission is, what we're supposed to be doing, and that everyone who, who, who works or partners with a school district, every individual that either drives the bus or serves the food or fixes something that's uh, broken, that takes care of computers, that is in the front office, uh, classroom teachers, every individual associated with the school district, whether they're partners or employees, our mission needs to be um, teaching children, loving children, because if you don't love children, you don't need to be in this business. This doesn't need to be your vocation uh, and preparing them for a successful future. So um, I, I, I continue to share that story throughout our school district and as I'm doing presentations, because I want people to know it's that simple. We want to teach our children, love them, and prepare them for a successful future. And everything that we do should be geared towards that outcome. So it's about kids. And there they are. And of course, that graduation and moving on to a college and career. So some of the goals um, that we've established that we're working on in our school district, uh, increasing our graduation rate. When I initially, uh, we are actually now at 90.3% graduation rate in Santa Rosa. Um, we were at 88.9 and uh, that increased to 90.3. However, um, it was a strange year last year. So there were some assessments that our students um, uh, did not take uh, and that and, and some of those assessments uh, students must pass in order to graduate. And some of those requirements for last year due to COVID were, were, um, uh, were waived. So uh, I, I don't want us to get secure with that 90.3. Um, I want us to be at 100% graduation rate. And uh, if we're focused on that mission of preparing students for a successful future, increasing that graduation rate is, is critical. And we'll be doing that through a lot of focus on readiness, just like Ruthie talked about with eCare, that readiness is so critical because we start working on graduation the minute those students and their families start engaging with our school district. Um, and also really working on our industry certification and opportunities for students to uh, have multiple pathways to graduation and then life beyond high school. Um, <clears throat> managing our fiscal practices to increase our financial condition ratio. When I started um, as superintendent, our, uh, our, our financial ratio was at 3.09. That is really low. And so I worked with our faculty, uh, with our, our senior staff 
um, to really look at uh, how we are spending our, our dollars, our fixed dollars, and then also to bring in additional grant dollars that are available, competitive grant dollars. And so right now, um, in the past four months, we've been able to increase our, our financial condition ratio to 6.7, I'm proud to say, and give uh, a, a 3.35 raise percent raise to our, our teachers and our staff and our blue collar employees so uh, we're moving in the right direction when it comes to fiscal management and uh, continuing to be very cautious and careful about how we're spending our funds but making sure that we um, are using those to attract uh, recruit and retain high quality teachers and that kind of goes into the next goal establishing and um, we have an equity committee that we've established, and I, I want to thank Penny because Penny, um, a member of the League of Women Voters, is uh, is participating in our equity and cultural sensitivity committee. Um, it is a very, very important work, and it, it seems as though there are, are many organizations right now that are really um, recognizing and engaging in this work when it comes to equity and diversity, and certainly as a school district, we need to do that. Um, there are several goals that we have for this committee. One is to recruit and retain diverse teaching staff. So we'll be breaking into subcommittees and one will be focusing on the recruitment and retention of diverse teaching staff so that we provide our students what we call windows and mirrors. First of all, so that, uh, that our, our diverse student population can see themselves and their teachers and their leaders. You can't be what you can't see. So we want to, we want to provide our, our students with mirrors uh, so that they can see themselves in, in a successful future. Uh, and the, the uh, windows are so that you can see into other cultures and understand uh, people from diverse backgrounds with diverse opinions. Uh, we'll also be looking at the uh, instructional practices. How are we making sure that the instructional practices we have um, uh, provide equity and opportunity for our students? So we'll be looking at some of the ways in which our students um, are eligible for um, honors classes, AP classes, dual enrollment, to see where do we have some of our students that are perhaps minority students that are underrepresented in, in those programs. Um, do we have um, a fair representation in our gifted uh, programs? And so really looking at how are we promoting and having high expectations for all our students and where have we created barriers that we need to remove so that our students have access to high quality education. <clears throat> the next one is to expand communication with families and communities through our social media and also family engagement and in our community. And it was, I was happy to hear Ruthie talk about the importance of family engagement. And absolutely, you know, our approach should be to work with the family. They are our children's first teacher. And uh, our, our students spend only a small portion of their day with us. The rest is with family. So to help increase a parent's or a guardian's capacity to work with their children and support their children, one of, that, one of those ways needs to be through communication, of course, but then also providing those opportunities. And that goes into my next slide, create a family opportunity center in every community. Um, this is one of my big goals, and this will take many years, uh, but a family opportunity center, I hope to have one um, in every community and eventually in every school. And that community has diverse needs. We have um, schools, there are 34 uh, school campuses in Santa Rosa, uh, from the J community, which is very rural, uh, to the Navarre and the Gulf Breeze community, which are of course our, our, uh, our beach communities. Uh, and have a, a higher socioeconomic um, average uh, to the Milton and East Milton communities where we have some of our highest um, poverty uh, communities and, and situations. So each community opportunity center will be based on the individual unique needs of that community. And there will be four major parts of that. One is, is to really provide um, our families with opportunities to engage and um, volunteer and support the school. And that would be for volunteer organizations like League of Women Voters. What are the ways in which you can contribute and support to the success of the students and the school? 
The second way is to do what Ruthie was talking about, that family engagement. So we are building the capacity of families to support their children's learning. The third area is really for that, that uh, the adults in the household, their own capacity building. So perhaps they want to learn um, how to read. Uh, maybe they want to become a first time home buyer. Maybe there are financial literacy classes that would help the family become stable uh, and self-sufficient. So that's the third way. And the fourth way is really if there are other necessities that the family may need. Maybe we need to make sure there is a washer and dryer in the Opportunity Center. Uh, then maybe they need to find out about ways in which they can obtain supplemental food, um, housing assistance, uh, whatever kinds of, maybe they have a, uh, a um, they want to work with career source Escarosa and find out about opportunities for employment. And so uh, those four main pathways through the opportunity centers we hope to be able to create. Um, the next goal is really, really to achieve a one-to-one -one device student ratio. So right now in our, our school district, it's been very critical to have laptops, um, to have iPads, um, devices so that students can learn whether they're at school in a brick and mortar setting or whether they're working remotely. Perhaps they're, they're learning all of, their, uh, all of their class and their schedule is, is remote learning or virtual learning, or maybe it's a student who has to quarantine. And so they take their device home to learn and have a seamless transition. Right now, our school district is about three students to one device. So we need to increase uh, till we have a one-to-one -one device. Not that students will never use that device or tool, that educational tool together in a group collaboratively. We certainly want to uh, engage in group collaborative, collaborative kinds of learning activities. But there may be in the future a need where each student needs that, that one device, and we want to be able to be ready for that. And the last um, focus is the developing a five-year strategic plan with community input. So we'll start engaging in that work this summer uh, and have um, town hall meetings, uh, really bringing in um, interested uh, folks like yourselves to sit in on those committees to provide us with some input and some feedback and, uh, and really look long range. Uh, we've got a variety of, of interests over the next five years. We can't implement them all at one time, but we need to have a pathway to be able to get to that full year, uh, that full implementation in five years. So those are some of the goals that I've, um, I hope to accomplish. A few of our demographics, right now we have an enrollment of almost 28,500 students. And although we took a slight dip in enrollment this year, if you've driven through Santa Rosa County, you have seen the development that is going on everywhere. So we are in the midst of really planning for that growth. We have a new school, East Bay K-8, that will open up. Um, this school is uh, in the Navarre area, um, and it will open up this August. So we've already hired the principal. Uh, we'll be hiring the assistant principal for that school um, at our April 6th board meeting. And uh, so uh, we just, uh, our school board has just approved the attendance zones for East Bay K-8. And uh, so we're really excited about, about having this school in the South End. Uh, right now, it's, it's critical that we open up that school because so many of our schools in the south end of our county are, are, are at the brim and, uh, you know, they are, they are at capacity. And so uh, East Bay K-8 will allow us to be able to lower the, the enrollment numbers at those schools to accommodate for all that new growth that is coming. In the PACE area, in uh, school year 2023-24, we'll be opening up Wallace Lake K-8. It will probably not remain that name, but right now that's where the location is, Wallace Lake Road. Uh, so we'll be opening up that K-8, which is just north of PACE. Another um, school that we hope to open up, um, I don't have a, a definitive start date yet. We're still acquiring the property for this. Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, with a Lachlan Technical College, and so we are hoping to open up a South End Technical School, uh, and then of course a North End High School. So those are all in the planning stages. Some of our current projects 
We've got about 64 career academies at our middle schools and high schools, from cybersecurity to construction to a teacher academy. All of our career academies focus on high paying, high demand jobs that are relevant to our area. I mentioned Lachlan Technical College and, and Jane mentioned our one family, one year, one home project, which is a, the first of its kind in the state of Florida. And now there are five other counties that have a one family, one year, one home project. Um, soon um, we'll be on CNN. They contacted us and want to be able to tell the story of, of this transitional housing program. And then one of our other projects that you may have heard about is our STEAM transformation. It is a K-12 transformation, bringing science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics into to each classroom, every classroom in our school district. And really what that's about is not so much the content, is about how we teach and we learn through critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and creativity. Future projects include um, a Defar Department of Defense STEM education grant, 1.5 million. Hopefully we'll hear some good news about that grant soon. And that will focus on middle schools and um, health related STEM occupations. Uh, we're working with um, the Board of County Commissioners and um, our Economic Development Office on a Workforce Development Triumph Grant. We're hoping to be able to convert the old Santa Rosa Medical Center on Stewart Street into um, uh, additional um, space for, for um, uh, more career and workforce development. Uh, we're hoping to bring a helicopter maintenance program, as well as a water treatment facility management training program, the first of its kind in the state of Florida. Uh, we want to develop a STEM ecosystem and Dr. Smith and, and Marcus Chambers, and I have talked about that. That brings together all the entities in a community, uh, business industry, K-12, post-secondary, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, um, goodness, I just lost my words for a second. Um, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, zoos, uh, any, any entity that has something to do with STEM, um, maybe federal is very interested in being part of that ecosystem as well. We're doing some work in Algebra 1, um, some Axon research, because Algebra 1 and passing that end of course exam for students is a huge barrier to graduation. So we're working on identifying how we're going to increase our students' um, math identity. Sometimes students will tell you, I'm not good at math. I, I, I can't do math. That's not my thing. Well, we, we can all do math. And so we're trying to identify where we need to back up. And it's probably all the way to pre-K where we need to make sure that our students see themselves as competent when it comes to math. We're also working on uh, preparing for an application, and I know Dr. Smith will be doing this too, um, uh, with um, some uh, COVID-related uh, grants. We've got another $14 million that we need to prepare to spend on COVID-related activities. A lot of that will do have to do with uh, intervention and providing services to our students who throughout this pandemic have lost some ground. And then another reading intervention grant, both Dr. Smith and I will be engaged in that work uh, and have been fortunate thanks to Senator Broxson. Uh, there will be five counties in the state of Florida who get these funds. And uh, so we'll be working again to, to figure out how we provide intervention that is evidence-based to our students and prepare them um, you know, for the next grade level but help them to see themselves as readers and reading as being very important. Um, I'm gonna wrap up here very quickly uh, because I think I'm about 21 minutes right now. Um, as far as COVID goes, uh, our, um, our positivity rate in Santa Rosa is going down as a community. We were at about 30% test positive rate as a, as not as a school district, but a county, we're now under 8%, which is very, uh, which is very exciting um, that hopefully we're getting past uh, the worst of the pandemic. During this time, we have 90% of our students are in brick and mortar instruction and 10% are full-time or virtual. So we're working very closely with our Department of Health and the Board of County Commissioners and Emergency Operations. 
Um, they've done a great job of making sure that our employees that wanted to be vaccinated um, are getting vaccinated. So uh, um, even though we're in such challenging times, I think um, the pandemic has created opportunities for collaboration and for support and really focusing on the future. And so uh, being able to share with the League of Women Voters and to have you all engage with our equity committee is just really exciting work. Um, I know that we'll be sending out the survey that you've given us uh, that will focus on um, some of our students and are their social emotional needs. And that is certainly uh, critical and something that we're spending a lot of time on right now with uh, mental health counselors and making sure students know and families know how they can ask for support if they need it. So I appreciate the opportunity to share and um, I'll stop sharing my screen now and uh, but look forward to some questions later. Thank you, Dr. Barber. And we'll move right away to Dr. Tim Smith, Escambia County Superintendent. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see that. Um, want to uh, just thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to, to share today uh, about Escambia County and want to just thank Dr. Barber too for her partnership. Uh, she and uh, Mr. Chambers and I have had a great opportunity to collaborate uh, during the past few months and uh, the, the partnership we have is, is really terrific to have when we, we talk about education in the panhandle to the, the western part of the panhandle. Uh, so now, now, Karen, I will say I, I really was intrigued with the story about the okay. custodial employee at, at, the, uh, at NASA. So I may steal your story because <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> you go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, and Ruthie, uh, we, we, of course, had an opportunity to meet and uh, you and your team have so much uh, to, to bring to the families and the community. Really thankful for for you and and all the work that your organization is doing. And you know, as you're speaking, uh, you, I share I share very deeply some of those ideas about early early literacy and early childhood education. So very excited. I uh, want to go ahead and and uh, begin and and gonna going to take a little different route than um, my, my PowerPoint starts out with because I had the opportunity to uh, share with the State Board of Education recently uh, on behalf of superintendents uh, just a few items and I thought it might be helpful uh, to, to share some of those concepts that, that I presented. Uh, first of all, uh, what I what I shared with was as uh, superintendents in the state of Florida, we were very supportive of uh, the concept that the governor has in his proposed budget, which really is he what he did is he um, really came up with a design to minimize the impact <clears throat> on lower student enrollments because that's been a, a difficult piece that we've had in school districts is uh, declining enrollment as a result of COVID. People have found out other opportunities, uh, other uh, possible ways of having their, their student educated. So uh, some of our district enrollments have gone down. That's been a challenge. And the governor and the commissioner of education, uh, thankfully, very, very, very helpful of them in their, uh, their decision-making throughout the year have taken steps where we were not uh, suffering from low enrollment as it relates to our budgets. So I can tell you in Escambia County, we were embracing for a $4 million shortfall in this current semester. Well, the, the governor and the commissioner took a, a, a position where they were able to spread out some finances and cushion us uh, where we didn't have to take that take that fall financially. So we're very, very appreciative of that. And what the governor's budget does is he proposed an increase in per pupil funding to 
offset lower lower enrollment numbers. So very very thankful for that, and um, we we appreciate that support. Uh, we we also uh, have been encouraged uh, through executive order to really try to get as many kids to come back to the brick and mortar, to come back to our campuses. Uh, and, and so those initiatives have been very helpful as well. And, and in fact, I, I attribute some of the return to our school from that, uh, that executive order because uh, we, were, we were very aggressive in our response to that and, and the communication we had with families, really encouraging them to get back to the campuses. And the reason for that is we ran some numbers where the difference in grade performance, just looking at our first quarter uh, report card grades and our second quarter report card grades, where there, there was a difference between students who were on campus and students who were off campus to, to the betterment of those who were on campus. They, the, the discrepancy leaned towards their their favor. So we know that students are learning more when they are on campus. Now that's not to say there's a, a certain percentage of students who do well on, on remote learning. That's, that, that is the case for some of our students, but collectively we see those trends are, are quite strong uh, where being back on campus has a positive difference uh, in, in performance. So uh, the, the other piece I wanted to share too is that in the proposed budget, there was uh, $10 million of increased funding uh, recommended that the legislature uh, approve for mental wellness. And we really applaud that, uh, applaud that stance. Um, we know it's been tough on our kids. It's just been, it's been different. And some of our, our students, their days have been disjointed uh, where they may start it off in remote learning, come back to brick and mortar, but then they might have had a student in class who had COVID and they, we had to contact trace. So students who sit around that student might have missed two weeks of school. And then if a teacher fell into that situation, students might have had two weeks of substitutes coming in and out. And so just this, this uh, lack of consistency for so many of our students uh, can be very difficult, can be very challenging. So having more money to support the, the, the needs for our students in that social, emotional, and, and mental wellness is, is greatly appreciated. I um, wanna, wanna make one more note too before I, I really jump into uh, my PowerPoint, is that in, in Escambia County, our, our transportation costs are uh, funded in a, 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 above 50%, I believe it's about 56% of the budgetary dollars cover our, our transportation costs. So we have to pull dollars from elsewhere uh, to, to bridge that gap. Part of the reason for that is we're very particular on hazardous bus route uh, conditions. And what that means is if we have a student who lives within a two mile radius of the school, but their way to, to school is not very safe, uh, there might not be sidewalks or whatever the case is, we're gonna bust those students. And so we, we increase that and we're gonna err on the side of safety. So we have a lot of bus routes uh, that fall into this hazardous walking uh, category. And um, the other thing in Escambia that we do is we have a lot of school choice. So if a student wants to go to another uh, school that has, let's, let's say, a particular career academy that, that they are interested in, we run what we call trunk routes. So we have routes going maybe across the county or north or south or east or west, wherever uh, the, the needs are. So we, we have a, a lot of additional busing for that. So um, the, the reason I mention all this is because the hazardous, hazardous conditions is we're really, we're really trying to um, provide safe, safe path, pathways to our schools. And as we develop, especially in the northern part of our district, that infrastructure is really critical for when new building is taking place for us to be cognizant of the need for sidewalks, the need for crossing lights over, over large intersections and busy intersections. And so, um, we, we, we certainly want our community to be aware and cognizant of that 
that need so we have safe paths, pathways to school. So I wanna uh, jump into the uh, PowerPoint at this time. I wanna start with saying, I came into a district with a strong foundation. I wanna congratulate uh, Mr. Malcolm Thomas on the work he did and, and thank him for our transition and for the five outstanding board members uh, that we have that form our board and our incredible employees. And, and as I say that, I, I, I wanna make note that it is amazing what our teachers have done as well as our support employees, our maintenance employees, our, our administrators. COVID has been nothing like we've experienced in the past. In, in the past. And so it, it, uh, principals and assistant principals, their contact tracing, it, it, they just lose hours and hours of, of instructional leadership time because they are, are attending to these needs and, and they're prioritizing uh, safety of our, our students and our, our staff members. And I really applaud them for doing that. That's a pressing need. We, we have to, more than anything, make sure our, our staff and, and our students are safe. And so our, our administrators have done a great job and it's taken a lot of time, but they're, they're vigilant about that. And, and I really applaud them for that. Our teachers, I, I walk into a classroom and there's four monitors sometimes around a, a teacher's desk and they're, they're talking with their kids online and while they're instructing the, the kids in the classroom and, and the dynamics are absolutely incredible of what they are doing. But what our teachers have done is they have just taken a deep dive into it and they will not give up. They will not stop and they collaborate and they share and they've improved their practice in this COVID world throughout the year. And I just tip my hat to, to the educators, uh, not only in Escambia, but in, in all of the state of Florida. Uh, it, it's been incredible uh, to see the heart and the grit that our, our teachers have had and then our, our custodial employees, they're, they're working so hard to keep classrooms clean, to provide the personal protection equipment as are many of our, our district level employees. So it's been a great team effort. So when we look at Escambia, we look at where the foundation is and where we go in the future. And so there's been strong academic performance in the 2018-19 school year. That was the last accountability cycle. 15 schools increased the letter grade. Tremendous uh, surge in academic performance there. Um, and so our job is to keep that going and even uh, push the trajectory to, to higher levels. Uh, district has well-managed operations, uh, human resources and, and finances. Really, uh, our, our finances are, have, been, have been really managed well and a keen eye to that has been uh, focused on financial stability. That, that can be very challenging at, at, at times um, and, and especially when you have an uncertainty uh, that exists. And uh, as I said earlier, we thought at one point we were gonna have to find $4 million and, and deal with that shortfall, but, but thank goodness the state came through and helped us out. So, uh, so there are many good things uh, that exist in the county. Um, also, some great blessings in our community. I was so excited when I came to Escambia and, and I have to say, I'm just so honored to be uh, in, in my role uh, leading the district and to be a part of this incredible community. And I quickly learned the heart and the, the soul that our, our community has for our schools and our, our kids. And so I, I saw that the half cent sales tax for capital dollars where we can renovate and, and build schools has been voted for a number of times and passed a number of times here in, in the district. The Escambia Children's Trust was just voted in this past November. 61% of our residents in the district uh, in, in the county voted for that. that. That's such a strong statement on the, the heart and the care our community has for children. The Studer Institute and Achieve Escambia working to, together to 
focus on that early childhood development, having the brain bags go into hospitals where they're given to new mothers and really bringing in experts. I, I was able to hear uh, Dr. Hungerford from Harvard, uh, expert on the achievement gap, talk about the, the importance of brain development in the ages of zero to two. And as you think about it, uh, premature births, often a, a child will go into uh, an incubator and there's incredible growth in weeks. Well, if you think about that, that doesn't necessarily stop those first two years. There's incredible, incredible capacity development in the brain. And so the community looking at that and trying to provide options or, or excuse me, opportunities, but the knowledge of that. Dr. Hungerford said there are five steps that can be taken by parents, five practices that just create great growth in, in brain development. And, and it also postures students to be ready for kindergarten. So uh, really excited about that drive in our community. And we just have so many caring leaders and, and government officials and, 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 and people throughout our community and the military and, and churches. Um, but as I said earlier, very, very fortunate to have dedicated teachers and support employees, administrators, and, and our, our five board members. I, I have to say, I, I just really enjoyed working with our board members and they have this really strong common thread. And that is each one of our, our talented board members, they care deeply about children and they care deeply about our schools and our, our children learning in schools. And I, I'm so thankful for the heart and, uh, and dedication that they bring every, every day to our, the Escambia County School District. We also have tremendous parents. Our PTA has had such a tough year because they want to volunteer so bad in our schools and we've had it been closed to, to volunteers and uh, that's, been, that's been hard for them. So they just can't wait to get back into to our schools and to provide those opportunities. So where are we going as, uh, as a district in, in Escambia County? Uh, I, really three points that I like to, to highlight. First, we wanna increase our student proficiency rates where our students are, are learning more and more. The second thing is we, the second point is we need to close the achievement gap, uh, specifically between our black and white students. There is a 34% achievement gap between black and white students in, English language arts, and there's a 35% gap in math. That's in our district. Now, the district I came from wasn't much different uh, as far as the achievement gap and the state of Florida, that those metrics are 29% achievement gap in math and 29% in, in English language arts. So what's happened is, and this is a national issue, we have to talk about this, we have to address this, and it is time for us to eliminate that gap. The reality is when you look at the numbers, and let me step back a second, because uh, I wanna add this piece as well. I recently had a conversation with a research group, national, national company research group, and I posed the question. I said, can you tell me one school district in the United States of America that has closed the achievement gap between black and white students? This is what I heard. No, no. But we do have some school districts in the country that have made progress. I think that, that's an encouraging thought, but the reality is we live in the United States of America in 2021, and we've had, the, we, we've had this, this is not a new achievement gap, and it's persisted, and we haven't solved it. We, we haven't gone after it in a way that's made a difference. Now, I can tell you the district I came from just about every time we talked about goals and vision, closing the achievement gap was, was the number one topic. But the question is, why as a nation is our educational system good for a number of kids, but it's not good for a number of kids? It's a condition that has to be addressed. It has to be dealt with. And we have to eliminate that achievement gap. Our school system should be effective for every child. And so in Escambia County, 
our, our job is to close that achievement gap and make sure every student receives a quality education and has a tremendous future awaiting from, for them because of the opportunities that are available to them when they graduate. Now, for us to do that, that's, a, that's as I said, the, the research company told me there wasn't one that they knew of that had closed the achievement gap. That's, that's a, a, a Herculean effort, but it's time to do it. And, and, and there's no, I, I've been in education over 30 years. I don't wanna wait any longer. It's time now. And I think when we as a country put our, our hearts and our minds together and our, our drive together, we can do great things and we, we can accomplish monumental hurdles. But we have to be unified to do that. It can't just be me. I'm, I'm not, I don't have all the ideas. I, I, I'm not capable of doing that by myself. I need to have all of our district employees on board with that. I need all of our community leaders. I need all of our residents to be on board with that. I need the state. I need universities. We have to be united as a society to, to uh, eliminate this achievement gap. And, and that's, that's in a core component of the vision. The mission that uh, I, I bring is to provide a, a, a safe, positive, nurturing environment every day for our, our students where they're learning at high levels, they're graduating and they go forth. They use their learning to be helpful, productive citizens. And it's important that we teach our students that there's a purpose why we're learning all of these standards and these subjects. It's because we want to equip you, we want to strengthen you to give back to your community through your job, through being a great family member, through being a volunteer, through being a community advocate, and, and whatever the role that they're called to be in, we want them to have a focus on, on on doing what's good and right to, to help the communities and to help others. So when I speak about our, our vision and our mission, uh, I, really, I, I really say it's kind of a 20,000 foot view at this particular time because we have entered a strategic planning process and we currently are gathering input uh, on, that, on that process from uh, our district employees and uh, we are about step step two into that, and the, we eventually will be asking community uh, for community input. But we want to take that, and then we want to shape in the vision and the mission, and we want to fine tune it, and we want to have pillars of goals where we focus our efforts. So I say my vision and mission are twenty thousand foot because it's a launching spot. But what it really needs to, and I go back to that unity piece, it needs to be our vision, our mission, where all the community owns this. We, we jointly own it. It's our school system. And after all, residents who don't have children, pay, they pay, our residents are paying for our school system. So I want our, our, our citizens to be, excuse me, that's my, my phone. Uh, I, I want our, our residents to be proud of their school district. I want our residents to feel that it is their school district. And I think that's really, really important. So there's a host of ways, uh, as I'll, I'll try to wrap up here in the, in the next minute or two, uh, there's a host of ways to, to do this um, and, and how we're gonna do this. Kindergarten readiness, expand preschool opportunities, um, support parents with uh, children beginning at age zero. We've talked, we've been, uh, designing a number of pilot programs, uh, looking at community partnership schools. Uh, that, that's a concept at Weiss Elementary where we have three-year-old uh, children in a classroom on campus. And so we've been talking about how we can expand that concept. Uh, looking at new funding streams, uh, we must have outstanding instruction, great staff development, and we must have strong measures and accountability in place. So the last piece um, that uh, I, I share with you is that you are, you are needed. We need to, to be a great united community where we are doing great work for kids. And so your support and your advocacy 
that you give has made such a great difference in our community. And, and we need you to keep doing the great work that, that you've been doing. And we thank you for all of your, your support. And uh, we just want to emphasize the last line on that PowerPoint when we talk about reaching all of our kids and, and having our system be effective for every single child who comes through. We must, we can, and we will. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, I know we have many questions at this point. I'm not sure who can hear me, <laughs> but um, I would like to turn it over back to uh, Mary Louise and let's hear some of the questions from our audience. Sure, we, we do have a considerable number of questions. Um, first of all, this first question is for Dr. Smith. Um, and it's a long one, so bear with me. We are delighted to have you as superintendent. You bring with you many talents and experiences that you can share with us here in Escambia County. Here's our question. In Orange County, during the 2019-2020 school year, there were two school arrests per 1,000 uh, students. Whereas here in Escambia County, during the same period, our arrest rate was 9.3 per 1,000 students. What factors do you think contributed to Orange County's success in having such a low arrest rate? And what can we do here to help you produce a similar result and increase the use of civil citations, perhaps, which may include appropriate family or individual counseling, community service, and restitution? It's a long question and I can read the second part of it if, if you need me to. I, I think that I, I think I um, am fine with uh, with the question uh, as, as far as understanding the, the components of that. Um, the first thing I, I share with you is I've already been in, in meeting with uh, the state attorney, uh, one of our juvenile judges on, in our uh, the individual who heads up the probation services for the, the district, as well as a couple of our law enforcement uh, officials who, uh, or, or law enforcement leaders who, who oversee um, the school resource officer program. And, and that was the heart of the, of the discussion, was civil citations and how are we using, using those. Um, a big, what, one of the, the big focus points in that conversation was about truancy issues, because we, we, we do have a number of students who are excessively absent, and what happens is that works up to a level where it's, it violates all kinds of laws and requirements, and so it ends up, uh, in, ends up going to court. And so that, that's a whole piece into itself. So let me circle back to Orange County and one of the reasons that the, the rate was lower there. A number of years ago, uh, there was an, in, an initiative to look at trying to lower the arrest rate. And what was happening is things were just flowing as, as, um, as our resources were, were in place. And so um, a student did something that was um, in, 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 in an extreme category of behavior, often what would happen is the school resource officer would arrest a student and, and take them off to the juvenile detention center. So the district uh, leadership, um, and, and this really came from uh, our superintendent, uh, Dr. Barbara Jenkins, an, an incredible leader. Um, the idea surfaced of having a police department for the district. And that actually was form it is in place today uh, where there is a police officer for basically a region of schools and so what they do is they work with the the uh, law enforcement agencies and the SROs and they're able to um, create um, a, a dynamic where they can intervene and they can work with the law enforcement officers with the a big focus on holding students accountable, working with the school, but not escalating to an arrest level. And so I think that's one of the, 
the areas that made a big difference in orange. That's, that concept is uh, really an important concept to, to look at. We, we don't want 14 year old kids having an arrest record. Uh, that, that, sometimes that has to happen when extreme, extreme behavior happens and, and especially in the, the violent arena because uh, we do have to have safe schools. But there are ways to use things such as civil citation to minimize that. Okay, thank you so much. The next question is for both Dr. Barber and Dr. Smith. So we'll start with Dr. Barber. Um, recognizing that the school resource officers have to balance law enforcement responsibilities with their role to help create more positive relationships between students and law enforcement. Um, detail for us your expectations for the pro persons who hold these positions. And if you could please include such factors as the selection process, including considerations such as diversity and equity and the training uh, program for these officers. And we'd like to know also if the school districts have no input into the selection, training or evaluation, how do you propose to make this process more of a collaborative one with the sheriff and or police chief? So Dr. Barber, over to you. Thank you, Mary Louise, can you hear me? I had some technical issues during Dr. Smith's uh, presentation. Right. We and good? Yes, I'm gonna try to take some of those additional ones of you out, but I am i won't do it until right. you're done speaking. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, my internet left for a while. And so I was trying to join from two of my phones and then I have a second laptop. So for a while, you you probably saw multiple Karen Barbers there, right. but... Uh, it, it does anyway, say that so you're, it says that your bandwidth is low. So if you cut out, we'll we'll just let Dr. Smith answer until you can get logged back in. No problem. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So we have a terrific uh, relationship with our our uh, sheriff's department and our school resource officers. You may know that after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, uh, there a law was passed so that we must have safe schools, and that includes. Uh, funds for mental health, of course. It also included funds to harden our schools so that we created single points of entry to ensure that our schools were safe um, and that they were secure and we knew who was on our campuses. It also requires that we have law enforcement present uh, during any school related activities, whether it's during the school day or after school or at night. Um, and so, um, I have to say that about 24 years ago, uh, I was an assistant principal at Holly Navarre Middle School and Bob Johnson, who was our current sheriff, was my school resource officer. So he and I worked very closely together and, and I joke that um, I raised uh, Sheriff Johnson and you're welcome. <laughs> he is a, he's an excellent, excellent sheriff for, for our county. And um, he, uh, he, he and I worked very closely together. <clears throat> Even before I became superintendent, the relationship was great. And so we very quickly made sure that we had law enforcement officers um, at, on all of our school campuses, pre-K through um, our technical college level. Uh, as far as the selection process, that hasn't been something that, um, to my knowledge, we've had input in. Um, but uh, having been a school resource officer himself, I can tell you that Sheriff Johnson has done an amazing and a very effective job at, um, at selecting the sheriff's deputies who would be in, that, um, in those positions. Um, it's now saying my internet is unstable. Can you hear me still, Mary Louise? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, very good. Uh, so the philosophy and the approach that we take with our school resource officers, so they're not just there to um, ensure um, that you know, anybody who is violating the law or violating one of our school board policies or of our code or student conduct 
is, is handled in a punitive fashion. They become part of the fabric of that school campus. We want those students to see law enforcement as, as, a, as, a, as a member of our school community. And uh, so they're involved on a level of building relationships and helping students feel safe and faculty feel safe so that should we have to address an issue of safety or bullying um, or any other type of uh, violation that, that we have the relationships in place already and the great communication. Uh, when, uh, with our students who are justice involved youth, our law enforcement, um, our school resource officers know who those students are, but they are not there to, to make sure, you know, that or to catch them um, should they, they violate their probation. They are there to be a support for that student. And so that's really the approach that we take, that they are there to support students. They are a resource for our students and our faculty. And, and that culture of collaboration and um, that culture and climate that we create, uh, that this is a, a, we are focused on supporting students and supporting our faculty and staff um, so that they're all successful. Um, that, that's the kind of proactive approach that we take resource officers. Um, they are under the leadership of Lieutenant Bobby Samples. And uh, so uh, it, is, it is constantly a collaborative problem solving approach that we take with them that I think has served us uh, extremely well. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Barber. Over to you, Dr. Smith. Well, we have um, a group uh, that we call, the, the, we refer to them as guardians, and uh, we hire them within our district to supplement the school resource officer program. So our school resource officers are present in our secondary schools. Most of our elementaries have the, the guardians that we hire. So we, we have a two-fold program there. And the guardian program has been very successful. Uh, we, we've uh, had the SROs um, in the secondary level and that seems to be working fine. Haven't had any uh, really major red flags surface on, on that uh, implementation of the school resource officer program. Of course, we have two entities. We have the sheriff's department and we have the city of Pensacola, depending upon where the school is zoned. Um, had a great opportunity to meet with Sheriff Simmons um, about a month ago, and he and his team, and uh, very he is very pro schools, uh, supporting schools, having a safe school environment. He, um, he is a, a strong supporter of the school resource officer program. And so I think we're in a really good situation uh, where maybe even in the future, we can get more school resource officers. It's what happens is you can get into some funding issues because um, th th there has to be uh, adequate funds on, on both sides because we, we share the cost of that through the law enforcement agency and the school district. So, um, we, both, both entities have to have the, the funding to add school resource officers. I uh, haven't, haven't uh, seen uh, a concern about the, um, or, or certainly haven't heard any concerns about the diversity or of, of our, our safety personnel. And we, we take control of the guardian hiring. So um, that's all, that's all in house. So that piece we, we have, 100% control, whereas with the SRO, um, we, we do rely on, on the law enforcement agency to, they, they do the hiring and they do the evaluation of the employees. So it's important to have really good relationships, very positive, very fluid, open communication uh, based relationships with those uh, law enforcement agencies. And I feel, I feel pretty good about that. Um, in fact, I feel really good about that. After, with our meeting with Sheriff uh, Simmons, I was, we just really um, had, had a, a great, great conversation, a great dialogue. And I think he and I see uh, the SRO in, in a very similar light. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a positive program for us for many years. Look forward to meeting the Pensacola uh, Police Department uh, chief who is going to be hired in the future. Uh, so we'll see who that is, but 
we certainly want to have a great relationship uh, with Pensacola PD as well. And we're, we're assuming that the, um, the SROs get different training depending upon which school they're in, right? So the elementary school SRO would have much different training than the high school SRO. Are we right in that? Well, th there certainly is uh, common language amongst uh, the SROs where they have some training that pertains to all, all levels. Um, I, I think that probably varies from region to region uh, to, to how detailed it gets in differentiating between the elementary and the secondary. Um, there, there are different programs that SROs implement at, at the elementary level. So previous district I worked in, we called it the DARE program. Right. Um, and so that's a pretty well known program. Our elementary student SROs would be trained in, in that in delivering that as opposed to a high school SRO, they wouldn't be involved in the DARE program. So, so you do get some programmatical variances there on, on the training for the SROs. Okay, thank you. And this next question is again for both of you. So we'll start with Dr. Bar Barber. Um, SEDNET, S-E-D-N-E-T, is a multi-agency network for students with emotional slash behavioral disabilities that serves the child functioning poorly in the home, school, or community due to alcohol, drug abuse, or mental health problems. It was active in its Gambia and Santa Rosa County several years ago. Um, do you have a current field representative in our area now? Yeah, we do. We do have a representative and we work closely with them. We also work very closely with um, our CDAC counselors uh, and our MFLAT counselors. Uh, and both of those organizations, as well as Lakeview, um, work with us when it comes to behavioral health. So uh, we have, um, and additional uh, counselors have been brought on that are mental health counselors uh, through some of our CARES Act dollars. So we have counselors, trained mental health counselors, licensed mental health counselors that are on all of our school campuses. And though that those counseling um, uh, services are available to, again, our, our military connected students, um, our, our other students who are on campus uh, or who may be learning virtually. So we have telehealth um, services available for mental health counseling, uh, as well as uh, through our, our, our devices or laptops, our mental health counselors are able to work with our students. And then we have through Lakeview um, a mobile response team so uh, that if we really have uh, students that are, are in a, a critical, a crisis, uh, we work with the families, do an assessment, and then work uh, for uh, a continued behavioral health services um, or additional assessment and, uh, and treatment for those individuals with support for the family. So SEDNET's uh, very important to, to our schools and uh, we have a, a rather large uh, exceptional student education department um, and we also have a, a student services department and between the, the two groups um, SEDNET comes in to be very, very helpful. Resources are important and being able to provide uh, what is needed for our students and, and some of our programs is, is really critical. Um, I, I, I think when you look at um, what some of our students are, are facing and uh, some of the supports they need, we, we need, we need all the help we can get. We, can, we need all the su support from SEDNET. We need all the expertise we can pull together because some of our kids have some some very challenging challenging issues uh, so we will we have quite a range of exceptional student education services that we provide um, as dr barber said we also uh, use lakeview um, and we have um, schools with different programs um, some some are pretty intense programs that we have to to best meet meet those those student needs that we have Okay, 
And the next question is also for both of you, but uh, well, I've got you, Dr. Smith, I'm gonna make you talk some more. It says uh, in this question for both superintendents, how will you help ensure that students who are members of the LGBTQ community are included in your non-discrimination, included in anti-bullying policies and are able to form student organizations without retribution? Well, I think that goes back to the core of really one of the, the core components of, of the mission I shared earlier, and that's to have a safe, nurturing and encouraging environment for, for all of our, our kids. And so however a, um, so some of the issues surrounding this topic come up, the, the bottom line is every single child is important and precious to us. And Kids have different backgrounds, different cultures, different uh, unique attributes that they bring with them. And it really actually speaks to, I'm going to digress here just a moment. It really does speak to the complexity of what a teacher has to do is have to teach, uh, you know, a class full of students. Often at the high school level, you're looking at 25 students who have very different backgrounds, different learning styles, learn in different ways. And, and they have to bring them all together uh, to learn all the standards. And, and so sometimes we, I think, miss that, the, the true complexity that exists for a teacher. There's really quite no other pro profession like a classroom teacher. Uh, but in, with that is that whole philosophy of every child is unique and special. And, and we're, we have lots of similarities, but we also have lots of differences. So, it doesn't matter what those differences are. Every child needs to be safe. They need to be respected. They need to have, uh, if, if there are issues that are raising concern for them and they're not feeling comfortable at school, we, we need to support the, the student. So it's, it's really, to me, the, the way a school should be run and the way an environment should be, every student, regardless of their their sexual orientation, their gender identification, their religious beliefs, their cultural background, whatever the case is, every child should feel safe, should be encouraged, should be respected, and should be welcomed, have that welcoming and embracing feeling at school. Dr. Barber, your turn. Same question. The work we're doing with this equity committee is really making sure that our, our practices, our, our policies, but our day-to-day -day practices and culture within our schools is one that is inclusive uh, and that is also sensitive to the diverse needs of, of all of our students. Uh, so we have school board policies in our code of student conduct uh, that prohibit discrimination with, within a, a school environment. Uh, and then we really have to develop that culture. Um, we have uh, 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 many of our schools are what we call capturing kids heart schools in which we are really, really establishing what we call a social contract in which we, we make sure that our students and our staff agree about how we're going to treat each other. Um, and uh, the students are part of creating that that uh, social contract. You'll see one on, on a school wide basis you'll see social contracts in every classroom. And if you walk in one of our classrooms, one of the student representatives will come up and say, hey, I, I need you to see our social contract. And that social contract is on the wall. And it's, it's a, as a visitor, you, you sign it and agree to, this is how we are agreeing to treat each other with respect, with, without arguing with, uh, and so, um, Every contract is very unique to that classroom, but the whole approach is that we're being inclusive, we're being supportive, um, and we're making sure that you know you can't teach, you can't capture a student's mind until you capture their heart. So capturing kids' hearts and also our positive behavior programs that we have in schools is really focused on on positive behaviors. And when we have a student who um, is doing something or a staff member who who isn't uh, 
perhaps making the right choice when it comes to how they treat others. Uh, our, our approach is to say, uh, first we have to teach that person or, or that student. Um, what are the expectations here at this school in this school district? And, and what do we need to do to help that individual learn how to have those positive, um, respectful relationships uh, with other students? Uh, and then everything, of course, is on a case by case basis. So as we work, especially with our LGBTQ uh, community and uh, students who identify with uh, another gender or have a, a different sexual orientation, um, we want we want to make sure that they understand that they're respected, that they can ask for help, uh, and that as um, needs arise or an issue arises, that that we address that quickly and that we work with the, the families of our students as well to make sure that we're receptive and we're listening and we're, we're addressing those needs as they come up. And then of course there are federal laws that require um, those actions to be taken too. Uh, even when it comes to the access of restrooms uh, and, um, and, and so what we wanna make sure that um, we are, we're aware of the law, we understand our responsibility when it comes to providing those students uh, and staff with a safe environment. And, and we continue to address um, issues as they occur very, very quickly. Okay, thank you. And this next question is just for you, Dr. Barber. Um, one of our members uh, would like to know if you will have staff reconsider or take every opportunity to include students who have had past discipline problems or behavior incidents and not can, not permitted to be admitted to the career academies. Sure, I'm, I'm not aware of that practice ever going on in Santa Rosa. If it did, it, it certainly was not in the recent, um, it, it recently. Uh, what we're trying to do, especially, um, so about four years ago, I established our, our support program for justice involved youth. And this may have been students who were in a uh, juvenile justice facility. It may have been students who had a civil citation that were on probation or went through team court. And our whole focus has been through that four years to engage those students, especially at the middle school and high school level in career academies. So I can tell you in the last four years, um, that has not been a barrier for our students. What we try to do through case management and through opportunities, both in the classroom and with our career academies, is to show them, let's keep you in school. This, um, what you're, the decision that you made, um, that got you in some trouble, does not define who you are and doesn't define your future. Uh, so uh, our career academies have been one of the ways in which we have helped engage those students and, and encourage them to stay in school and, and finish high school and then move on to um, college and career. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for both of you. So we'll begin with Dr. Smith. Although a focus on pre-K is certainly key to success, we can't forget those kids in middle and high school that have had challenges along the way. What is your intention regarding dropout prevention for these older students? Well, the, the first thing we have to do is we have to uh, thoroughly track the progress of our students. And what can happen is students uh, can fall off, off pace. And if, if we don't pick that up and we don't uh, know that that's taking place, it can uh, persist. And, and then we have a student in a, a far worse condition academically than had we picked that up quickly. So the first piece is tracking. Then the second piece is what are we going to do about that if there is a problem, if we have a struggling student? So um, one of the things I've been uh, speaking with about our, with our principals at the high school level is we need to start tracking ninth graders at the end of the first quarter. We, we need to know if we have ninth graders who are struggling. But then we have to craft appropriate intervention programs and, and full support and resource to them. And, and we, we, we need to provide oversight for those students so that they're not continually just going on and on and on without doing uh, what needs to be done for them to learn successfully. So um, 
ideally, um, you we add we add people and we have uh, guidance counselors who who can track track performance. The reality of that is, though, the funding for our guidance counselors is we have about one counselor for every 400 kids uh, at the secondary level. That's that's a, a great challenge for our counselors. And that's where mentors can help out tremendously because they can provide insight. They can provide one-on-one -on -one contact uh, with, with the students and, and just providing that extra set of eyes and oversight. And, and I've seen that uh, pay off for kids in the past. And I know we've had a lot of mentors in our community who, who they would love to be back on campus. We've had that closed down for COVID. Uh, so that's an important piece that we need to get back into, into play. Uh, I will tell you, we're looking at a, a pilot program for kids who are struggling with motivation. Uh, a lot of times our kids, they, you, can, you can have dialogue with them and say, why, why are you not doing well? And we, we know with our teenagers, we're typically, um, with a struggling teenager, we might get an answer that says, the student says, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't like it or whatever the case is. Well, we, we've got to push that. We've got to dig a little deeper, a lot deeper. But, but also we have to understand that sometimes kids don't articulate that. It's hard for them to articulate why they're struggling with motivation. They genuinely might not know. Uh, but we can't give up on that. We have to be relentless with that. And no doubt it can be frustrating when a school tries this, 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 and this. Um, I recently met with high school principals about students who were falling in our negative withdrawal category. And some of the things that our principals have done, well, we've met with this student 20 times. You know, it's not lack a lack for trying, um, but we, we just have to, we have to have those great intervention programs. Maybe it's um, uh, additional tutoring that's provided. Maybe it's pull out resources by specified teachers who have the ability to really coach up kids. Um, we, we, we just have to have uh, an array of interventions where we have our kids get back on track. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Dr. Barber, would you like to answer that one as well? Sure, I, I agree with Dr. Smith. You really have to have an array of interventions available. Um, you know, I'm so proud to say in Florida that we've had brick and mortar instruction five days a week since the beginning of the school year, because some of the best drop, dropout prevention um, efforts are athletics, our yes. extracurricular clubs. Yeah. And so to be able to engage our students, many of our students come to school uh, mm -hmm. because of that sense of belonging that they get. Uh, and the encouragement and that, uh, that family that they gain uh, from the clubs and activities that they're in, whether it be band or NJROTC or, or athletics uh, or some other kind of extracurricular club. So having those available and creating some of those clubs that perhaps some students might, it might be chess club, it, it might be some type of uh, gaming club, but whatever it is, we need to find that hook for that student and engage them in a positive way. And then if part of that, um, uh, uh, their reason for perhaps wanting to drop out has to do with an academic need, uh, then of course, providing them with that as well. Uh, our DJJ support program that I've mentioned already uh, was put in place and we really looked at over the years, the outcomes of our students. When it came to a student who had a civil citation or was uh, that had gone through teen court, we were able to turn that student around pretty quickly and engage them and get them on that positive trajectory. The critical kids that we had more difficulty with were some of our students who had been um, in a, a juvenile justice facility in which they were in this very structured environment and then when they were back in a regular high school that with, with some of the lack of structure, 
um, they struggled with that. So then we really had to individualize and, and do what uh, Dr. Smith was talking about with really having some of those mentors. So that's where um, each of those students were assigned a mentor at that high school. Sometimes that mentor happened to be our school resource officer who could really relate to that kid and really, really provide them with some support and understanding for some of the things that they had been through. Uh, and then of course, working with that family to engage them as well. Right now our high schools have their, um, we have an early warning system. So one of the, and I know in Escambia they do as well. That's kind of a requirement in the state of Florida that we have an early warning system to identify what are the indicators that a student may um, be prone to dropping out of school. And so we monitor that, we identify those students and then put a, a plan in place to, to make sure that we're keeping them or we're getting them on track. Some of the times students drop out because they fall behind in credits and they get discouraged. Uh, and that has happened this year, of course, with, with our pandemic. So we're using um, some of our, our uh, educational software to help them accrue some of those credits so they don't give up, they don't fall behind, or we help them catch up, get those credits so they can graduate on time. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions and I know that we've kept you over already, both of you um, and Ruthie as well. Would you like to stay or can you stay for those last two questions or do we need to wrap it up at this point? I am going to have to graciously uh, excuse myself <laughs> um, uh, at, at, at this time. We understand. We understand. Dr. Barber, how about you? I can stick around for a little while. Yes. Okay. And, and Ruthie, I know that you have some some important plans that you have to take care of today. So we, we understand if you have to bow out as well. So um, so audience, we'll, we'll stay on and finish those last two questions. And again, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for um, participating and for staying so long over time. Uh, but, but everything was very interesting to us. We don't normally have this many questions. So you can tell that our audience really enjoyed both of you speakers. Well, and, and, and thank you again for this, this wonderful opportunity to, to talk about the education of our youth. And, and thank you, your organization, for what you do uh, in, in the community. You have such a positive impact on so many people and on this community. And uh, again, I'm very, very happy to have had this opportunity to share with you today and hope everybody enjoys the rest of their weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Delightful. Okay, so um, Dr. Barber, here's one of the last two questions. Um, this is a long one. While the work that CDAC, MFLCs, and Children's Home Society do within schools is invaluable in providing emotional support slash counseling for students, with these organizations being separate entities, parent permission is required before they can provide most services. And this makes it difficult for them to provide crisis services to children during the school day without getting parent approval, which of course can be difficult on short notice. What's being done to better address crises among students during the school day? There was legislation passed that required that um, all personnel on a campus, uh, teachers, paraprofessionals, administrators, get uh, a full day of training uh, in youth mental health first aid. And so all uh, personnel on a school, and we're about two thirds of the way through all of our personnel being trained in youth mental health first aid. So that's kind of our first line of defense when it comes to um, making sure that not only are we seeing the red flags and warnings, but then we know what approach to take when we do have a, a student in crisis. Uh, so that is our, our first line of defense. Uh, we, we are continuing with that training. Um, our school resource officers as well, um, all of about three of them out of the 35 school resource officers we have, have been trained um, in uh, crisis intervention. 
and uh, the other three are set for that training. So we've got folks on, on campus every day that have been trained to be able to respond to students in that, in that crisis situation. Okay, thank you. And the last question um, has to do with, with funding. What is being done to retain educators and support personnel with experience in light of the state legislatures restricting money to hire new teachers and striving to reduce local bargaining ability. Right, uh, so in this past year, of course, you know, the governor said after he was elected that he was going to be uh, an education governor and uh, last year was considered, um, or this school year, uh, the year of the teacher. So there was legislation passed to actually raise the minimum teacher wage throughout Florida. Um, to a minimum of $47,500 a year. That is um, a, a goal. Uh, and so uh, school districts, many of them are well below that, uh, but we were provided with an additional $3.8 million in Santa Rosa County to address that minimum teacher pay. So we have three bargaining units. We have our Santa Rosa Educators Association, Santa Rosa professional educators, and those are mainly um, our school-related employees um, and uh, teacher assistants, paraprofessionals. Um, and then we have our blue-collar union as well. And so I can tell you that this uh, past year, um, we were able to, but let me go back to the legislation. What this legislation required was that about 80% of that $3.8 million we received was to go to classroom teachers. That left out uh, guidance counselors, that left out deans, that left out even interventionists that see students and provide them with um, instruction, but they aren't that traditional in the classroom teacher all day. And so what the school board and, and I did was to find other dollars from our general fund so that if you were in your, let's say your first through the ninth year of teaching, um, you were, uh, we needed to bring your salary up. Um, so right now, um, based on the money that we received from this legislation, uh, our teachers um, all earn um, 42,500 and some change now. Um, so we uh, were able to increase our minimum teacher pay, uh, but we used other resources that we had uh, and the 20% left of that 3.8 million to increase the wages of all of our teachers and staff. So the average um, percentage in wages increase was 3.35. Um, but uh, many of our teachers who were in years one through nine uh, received a higher wage. But overall, the average from first year through 30 plus years of teaching was 3.35. Um, I mentioned earlier, one of the goals of, of, that I have is to continue to increase our financial condition ratio. It's basic, basically a, a savings account so that if anything catastrophic happens, and it's required by law that you keep that ratio above 3%. Um, it's best if it's between 5% and 10%, and soon we will be at 7%. So we're, in, we're gonna be in a great spot for that. Um, as we plan for our budget for next year, it is all about how do we make sure that we are using our resources as efficiently as possible so we can retain and recruit and be competitive with our salaries and benefits for all our employees. So that's critical. Over 85% right now of our revenue is focused on salary and benefits. And that's where the magic happens. It's with the teachers and the paraprofessionals and the administrators. It's not with a, with a, a, a computer program. It's not with a book. It's with our personnel. So that's where we need to focus and invest. True. True, how true. It's lovely to hear someone say that though. Um, well, thank you so much for being so gracious to stay on and answer those last couple of questions. It was obvious that this was a very successful uh, presentation this morning, lots of interest from our membership. And again, they'll be watching online on demand um, as it suits their schedule and with some people as it suits their bandwidth, which I'm sure you can understand. So, so thank you again. And Jane, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. 
Thank you, Mary Louise. And I, again, say thank you to Dr. Barber. Uh, it was a very um, informative meeting and we, I can't say that we've had another topic this year that went over time. So if that matters, uh, uh, I think you can tell we have lots of involvement and lots of interest in the school districts where our children attend. Um, thank you to our membership for tuning in and for being here. And uh, your questions were, were very much on target and made, a, uh, made it for an interesting uh, ending to, to the presentation. And don't forget, we meet every third Saturday morning each month. We have a program and next month will be uh, entitled food insecurity and we will look at some things that are happening with food pantries and across the state with the Department of Agriculture. So tune in uh, for that one next month and um, I hope everybody has a good day and enjoy the last few minutes of your spring break, Dr. Barber. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm going out to work in the yard. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Okay, well, with that, I uh, will end the meeting for everyone and um, see you next time. Thank you, Mary Louise. Bye. Bye.